One question for the audience I wanted to start with is, how many of you have ever had neck pain or back pain? <laughs> That's the response I was expecting. And then how the second question is, who felt like they looked like the person on the left when they were younger, and now as they've gotten older, their posture hasn't gotten better? <laughs> yeah. So tonight, um, I'm going to try to give you a thousand foot overview to the spine. There's a lot to cover, but I'd like to break it down so that it's easy, easily digestible. Um, I'm going to describe spinal etiologies of back and neck pain, and then also clarify treatment options for degenerative disc disease, uh, kyphosis, so that posture of leaning forward, as well as scoliosis, or sideways bending of the spine, and then also touch upon osteoporosis in terms of its diagnosis as well as its management. So in order to understand the abnormal, we have to define the normal. And this is uh, very basic, but the spine is made up of uh, several sections, the cervical spine uh, made up of seven vertebra, the thoracic spine made up of 12 vertebra, the lumbar spine made up of five, and then the sacrum uh, and the coccyx are your tailbone. Um, this is the normal posture of the spine as well. So there's alternating curvatures. Um, and when you look at someone, from, at least from the side and then from the back, the spine is straight. Each of these segments of the spine is made up of different, um, different parts. And just so we define um, the vertebral segment, um, we can see here that the vertebral body is in pink. The vertebral discs are in between the vertebral bodies. The joints, which are called the facet joints, there's two of them at each level um, in the back. There's a spinous process, and then the spinous process attaches to the lamina. Uh, which will be important uh, when we talk about uh, pathology of the spine. And then the holes, um, this is where the nerves come out. And if we look further at each of the individual segments, uh, looking at the disc, there are two layers of the disc. There's the outer core, um, which is called the annulus fibrosus, which is a, and the inner core um, is called the nucleus pulposus. And you can think of it like a donut. So the donut, the jelly-filled donut, the jelly is the nucleus pulposus, and then the dough is the annulus fibrosus on the side. If we look at the vertebral body, it also has two uh, major parts to it. One is the cortical bone, which is the hard shell to the bone, and then there's also what's called the trabecular bone, which is the inner uh, portion of it, and this is spongy. That's where the bone marrow is. And the spine has significant flexibility and allows for a lot of motion because of each of these segments uh, connected by the joints. You can have flexion, extension, shown in the upper left-hand corner there. Uh, the bottom left uh, shows lateral bending as well as rotation. And uh, you can see that when the spine bends forward and backwards, um, it, it distributes the pressure on the discs um, pretty evenly, depending on which way you bend. However, when you start to age, this pressure changes. And the reason for this is because um, with age, the disc starts to lose water, starts to become stiffer, uh, loses volume and also loses nutrients. So you go from a relatively plump disc, um, healthy nucleus pulposus, um, a nice uh, thick annulus fibrosus, and then it becomes quite a bit thinner and, and drier. And this changes the biomechanics on the spine. And we see on the left-hand side here, the force distributions are relatively even within the disc. But on the far right, we start to see that with a degenerated disc, there, the pressure starts to increase in the back of the spine. And it starts to put more pressure on those facet joints. And when you get more pressure, abnormal loading, it can start to lead to arthritis. And so the, you first start with degenerated disc. This puts more pressure on the back of the spine, uh, which leads to arthritis in the facets. And then this is a vicious cycle, because then it changes the biomechanics of the disc. And it makes the disc degeneration worse, which then narrows the disc even further, changes the biomechanics of the spine, and then leads to more pressure on the back of the spine. Um, and so it's a, it's a very slow process, that, but over 10, 20, 30 years, um, this process usually starts around 40 or 50 years old, or probably earlier, depending on your genetics. So you can imagine by the age of 60 or 70, there's quite a bit of degeneration. And we, as we see on the far left, this is an end-stage uh, arthritis of the spine. So you see that that nice, uh, thick uh, um, disc is no longer, no longer present. Uh, these ridges are called osteophytes, and they're extra bone growth to help stabilize the spine. Um, and you can see that there's also the osteophytes and the, and the arthritis in the back of the spine. And when this happens, that space for the nerve 
starts to decrease, start to get less space. Um, and also with any type of motion, that arthritis, just as it happens in your knee and your hip, starts to cause pain. So pain in your neck and your low back uh, can, become, can come from arthritis from the facet joints, can come from the disc, um, and that's a major uh, etiology of, of pain in the back. There all can, also can be muscular pain um, and other things in your abdomen, but if it's spine-related, it's from the facets, uh, the joints, as well as the discs. Now, as you can imagine, that when the, the space for the nerve starts to narrow, you can start to have consequences or manifestations of nerve pain. And in the lumbar spine, when one of the nerves or both of the nerves are pinched, it's called radiculopathy. And if, depending on which nerve is pinched, depends on where you may have pain in your leg. And you see here in the diagram that the S1 nerve, which is pinched at the bottom between L5, uh, the, lumb the fifth lumbar vertebra, as well as the sacrum, causes pain down the back of your thigh, your buttock, back of your calf, to the bottom of your foot. L5 nerve can cause pain on the outside part of your hip, uh, outside part of your thigh, outside part of your calf, and at the top of your foot. The L4 nerve can cause thigh pain in the front, as well as front of the knee pain, as well as inside of the shin pain. And then L3 nerve uh, root pathology can cause pain in the front part of your thigh, and as the higher you go in the lumbar spine, the higher the pain becomes. So T12 or L1 is more groin pain. Um, in the cervical spine, something similar occurs. Um, so if you have pinching of the nerve, then you can have pain in one or both of the arms. And this is also called, called radiculopathy. It's called cervical radiculopathy. And similar to the lumbar spine, where you get a certain distribution of the pain um, in the leg, in the arm, it's very similar. So if the C5 nerve gets pinched, it's the outer side, outer part of the shoulder. C6 travels down to the forearm and to the thumb and the index finger. C7 goes down to the back of the forearm to the middle finger, and then C8 are the small ring finger and pinky finger. The nerves that are pinched higher up at C2 may cause a headache in the back part uh, or pain in the back part of the head, ear pain, jaw pain. Um, C3 or 4 can cause just neck pain isolated, and that's one thing that can overlap with the arthritis uh, in the joints and the disc. Um, if the pinching comes from a disc herniation, a portion of the disc that's pressing on it, um, we, we, um, we do consider surgery, and uh, I'll talk to you about the different surgical options in the low back uh, as well as surgical options in the neck for um, radiculopathy. Um, one of the options, and this is what we do after we've exhausted all non-operative treatment, physical therapy, anti-inflammatory medications, uh, as well as injections, um, but discectomy, as you may, many of you either have had or know friends who've had or heard about it, um, is essentially going through the back part of the spine and then reaching around the nerve and then taking out a piece of the disc from the front. Um, and in the lumbar spine, that's the easiest way of just taking out a piece of it and taking off the offending agent or the, the pressure that's on that nerve. You can do something similar in the neck. Um, it's called a foraminotomy. Um, and as opposed to reaching around the nerve uh, to get the disc out from the front, this is more of an indirect decompression. So you just take off the bone um, that's pressing on the back and you leave the disc that's coming from the front. Now if the di you want to take out the disc, the figure on the right is called an anterior cervical discectomy infusion. Uh, and this is where you take out the entire disc, take out the the, the disc that's pressing on that nerve, and then put a piece of bone graft or a cage um, to stabilize it, as well as a plate on the front. Now we talked about pain in one or both of the legs um, in a very specific nerve root distribution. The other consequence of having arthritis in the spine is, is central stenosis. So instead of having pressure on either side, there's pressure in the middle. Um, and you can see here that that occurs because of the arthritis that starts to um, cause uh, thickening of the ligaments. And so the canal, which starts off as a circle, as the arthritis grows, the canal starts to get smaller and smaller. And when this occurs, it can cause symptoms also in both legs, but in a very different uh, type of um, pattern. And the very classic presentation is what's shown here, is where when you get up and you start to walk, you start to get pain in your buttock, in your back of your thighs, down the back of your calves, and then it's relieved when you bend forward or sit down. So you may be at the grocery store and see people leaning on grocery carts. Part of the reason that occurs is so they can open up the canal um, so that their nerves have, have more room. Again, in terms of treatment, we start with 
physical therapy, injections, anti-inflammatory medications, and really when it gets to the point where walking is extremely difficult uh, and people can only walk half a block or a block because of that pain in their, in their buttock and their thighs, do we consider surgery? Um, the two major categories of surgery, and there's a lot of nuances to this, but the two major categories are just removing the bone from the back to give the pressure, to give the nerves um, more room. And that's called a, a laminectomy. And then the, in addition to, a, to doing a laminectomy, you can also put screws and rods in and also put bone graft. Uh, and that's called a, a fusion, a posterior instrumentation and fusion. And usually this is reserved, the screws and the rods are reserved for times when there may be instability. So when one of the vertebrae slipped forward on the other one, um, or if patient or patients have had previous operations uh, where if taking away more bone may result in instability. Um, but there's a lot of other nuances that go into deciding uh, whether to do just do a decompression or also doing an instrumentation and fusion. So just as we talked about uh, central um, pressure on the nerves in the lumbar spine and the low back, when you get central pressure in the neck, it causes different symptoms. And the reason for that is because the neck is where the spinal cord is, whereas in the low back, it's where the, just the nerve roots are. And you can see here on the left side, that's a relatively normal spinal canal in the cervical spine. And then when you start to get the arthritis, the, the disc generation in the front, as well as the uh, hypertrophy and growth of the soft tissues in the back, it starts to put pressure on the front and the back of the spinal cord. And you can see that this can happen at one level or as shown on the MRI on the right, can really happen at multiple levels. And this is the symptoms that are a consequence or a result of this are cervical myelopathy. And in the box down here are the major symptoms. And they're relatively vague um, because a lot of other things can also cause very similar symptoms. So numbness or tingling in the fingers, hands, and arms. So a lot of times this is confused with carpal tunnel syndrome or pressure on the nerve um, around the elbow, cubital tunnel, imbalance, poor coordination, clumsiness. Um, dropping objects, difficulty with fine motor skills like buttoning your shirt, uh, buttoning your pants, picking up coins, or even your handwriting changes, um, and also difficulty grasping objects, so not being able to pick up coins from your pocket, so just feeling clumsy, and, and some people describe it as feeling drunk all the time. The treatment for cervical myelopathy is um, a little bit different. Um, than the lumbar spine, and there's three major options. One is the ACDF, or the anterior cervical discectomy infusion, which we talked about being a treatment for radiculopathy as well, where you take out the entire disc, take off the pressure from the spinal cord from the front, and then put the bone graft or the cage in, as well as a plate. And then there's two types of operations from the back part of the neck. One is called a laminectomy infusion uh, with instrumentation, and the other one's called a laminoplasty. And in the middle, the laminectomy fusion instrumentation, similar to what we saw in the lumbar spine, it's taking off the lamina, essentially the roof um, that's causing pressure from the back, and then putting screws and rods in to stabilize the spine. In the past, a laminectomy alone used to be performed, but what was shown is that over time, the neck starts to fall forward. And I'll show you a picture of someone who had just had a laminectomy and the consequences of just doing that. So, now, um, the strong recommendation is that if you're going to have a laminectomy in the neck, you also have instrumentation and fusion to help stabilize it. Laminoplasty is an alternative technique that was developed in Japan to help maintain motion of the cervical spine, but also give it some stability. And as you can see in the upper right-hand corner, this, instead of taking off the entire roof, the entire lamina, you make a cut on one side here, then you make a trough or a half cut on this side, and then you open it like a door. Um, and it's called an open door laminoplasty. And then in order to hold the door open, a number of techniques have been tried. Some people will put a suture around the top here and try to uh, hold it open from this side. But a more stable construct is to put a plate that either is connected to uh, a bone graft or not, to put that bone graft and that plate in between the open aspect of the door, and then secure the plate to the bone. And you can see that here. So it opens the canal, but then it provides fixation um, on both sides of the door. And both are very, very um, uh, effective treatments for cervical myelopathy. Uh, there are some nuances when it comes to choosing which one to do. 
So switching gears, um, so we talked about the reasons for back pain and neck pain, talked about the neurologic consequences of, um, of degeneration of the neck as well as the lumbar spine. And then I want to talk about the consequences and going back to alignment changes over time, what are the consequences of having degenerative disc at multiple levels that are not related to the neurologic um, elements? So as you see on the left side here, the lumbar spine has a nice backwards bend to it. Um, it's a, a sway back. And then when you start to get the loss of the disc height at each of the levels, we start to get what's called flat back. And when you start to get flat back, you go from standing like this to standing more, for, more pitched forward. In addition to developing a flat back, you can also start to develop um, arthritis-related scoliosis. So the discs, in addition to becoming narrower, also start to slip on each other side to side. And that can come in a variety of um, severities, as we see on the left side here. Um, multiple levels have started to rotate and started to uh, slip on each other because the discs start to degenerate um, asymmetrically, uh, and they also start to become somewhat lax, and the joints in the back and the disc in the front can't support um, the weight, so they start to slide and rotate relative to one another. Um, this is an example of one of the patients um, that I've taken care of on the right side, and you can see that he has uh, quite a, uh, a large scoliosis in the lumbar spine that's causing him to tip over to the left side and also lean forward. And we'll go through what uh, surgical treatment he ended up uh, undergoing. In addition to uh, bending sideways, the scoliosis, we also talked about the loss of lordosis, so the flat back. Um, and that can also happen in the cervical spine. And so she see on the left side, this is a patient who had multiple levels of laminectomies. And over time, they've started to develop uh, a neck posture that's quite a bit bent forward. And you can imagine this is very debilitating because to be able to look forward requires a lot of, a lot of work. Uh, these are two other examples of patients who have difficulty standing upright because of uh, loss of the disc space in the lumbar spine. Um, you can see even on the far right that there's a reversal of the normal posture. And it, as you see, that comes in a variety of severities. And over time, uh, this kyphosis, so this bend, uh, forward bending posture, can continue to get worse. And as you start to lean more forward, uh, you start to look at the ground. And that's not, a, that's not an easy way to live. And so there's compensatory mechanisms for helping you continue to look straight uh, and look forward. And it's a variety of compensatory mechanisms that start in your neck and go down all the way to your ankles. So when you, if your low back is flat and you look forward like this, in order to look straight ahead, you have to bend your neck up, you have to flex your knees, extend your hips, and then also bend your ankles. So it's a very, uh, it's a full global uh, compensation for a very localized pathology. And you can imagine trying to walk like that all day is a very debilitating state. And by the end of the day, most people cannot continue to stand upright. And uh, our field has published uh, quite a bit on the functional limitations of this state or sagittal plane deformity. And when we look at scores for general function, as you start to lean more and more forward, your general function uh, declines significantly. And then looking at a disability index in relation to uh, your low back, as you start to lean more and more forward, uh, have more difficulty standing upright, your disability index also rises. And so on the left is general function. As you get pitched more forward, your general function decreases. And when you get pitched more forward, your disability uh, related to your back also decreases. And this is all a consequence of, or it can be a consequence of just arthritis. Now, another common cause of dif difficulty standing upright or loss of um, the normal curvature of the back and kyphosis are compression fractures. And this is often caused by osteoporosis. And osteoporosis, if we go back to looking at the two parts to the vertebral body, um, is really a, a problem within the trabecular bone, or that inner spongy part where the bone marrow is. And shown on the left is the normal architecture of the trabecular bone. And you can see that there are um, pockets within the bone. And then in a patient who has osteoporosis, those pockets are quite a bit larger. And it's because of the loss of that trabecular bone. And this can be for a variety of reasons. It happens in males and females. Uh, 
more common in um, uh, in females in postmenopausal uh, because estrogen is a major um, driver and important contributor to the maintenance of bone health. So estrogen deficiency causes bone loss, uh, low calcium diets, um, and uh, really a, a variety of other metabolic disorders that essentially remove calcium for the bone uh, or decrease your ability to uh, absorb calcium. Um, but a, a big driver of this uh, in general is estrogen deficiency. And similar to arthritis at multiple levels causing difficulty standing upright, um, osteoporosis can also result in this. And this is a, uh, we've seen this in many patients that have compression fractures at multiple parts of their spine start to have difficulty uh, standing upright because each of those vertebral bodies have lost their own height and collapsed forward. Osteoporosis in terms of the diagnosis um, is with a DEXA scan. And um, if you have ever had a DEXA scan, it gives you three, it gives you a T-score and a Z-score. The T-score is, uh, is more important. Um, and it really falls into three categories. One is um, a score that's positive or up to negative one. That's considered normal. And osteopenia is considered between negative one and negative 2.5. And then osteoporosis is when the score, the T-score is less than negative 2.5. So the more negative you get, the more brittle your bones are. And the treatment recommendations are uh, diet changes for patients with osteopenia, calcium and vitamin D, and then pharma pharmacologic treatment is um, indicated in patients with osteoporosis. Now I wanted to go through a couple of the different types of uh, pharmacologic treatments for osteoporosis and talk about which parts of bone regeneration and bone um, health they target. So in, the, in all of our bones, there's two major types of bone cells. The red here are called osteoclasts, and clasts break down bone, and the green cells are osteoblasts, they form bone. Um, and when the bone is broken down, this is a normal remodeling. Our bones are going through this all day, every day. Um, when the bone is resorbed, it's then regenerated, and then the new bone is then resorbed, and this maintains the integrity uh, and the strength. One class of the um, medications that targets osteoporosis are called anti-resorptive medications, the bisphosphonates, and these target the osteoclasts, so they prevent the breakdown of bone. The other side of the, of the, of the um, focus on bone formation or stimulation. Uh, one common medication is called Forteo. It's an anabolic uh, parathyroid hormone uh, and also proestrogens. And then newer antibodies that, are tar that target the interaction or the cell signaling uh, between the osteoblasts and the osteoclasts um, are also used. One example is called denosumab, and it's an inhibitor of one of the signaling molecules uh, that the osteoblasts use to stimulate or tell the osteoclasts to resorb bone. Uh, if we look at the efficacy of various anti-osteoporotic drugs and the fra and fracture prevention in general, as well as regaining bone mineral density, the BMD of the spine, um, we see that the Forteo or teriparatide down at the bottom here is um, the most efficacious in terms of uh, increasing spine bone mineral density gain. Uh, and this is a medication that if someone has osteoporosis and they end up requiring uh, or considering doing a fusion and instrumentation on them, um, this is something that we'd like to start at least uh, several weeks, if not several months, before undergoing the operation. Um, you can see that it increases spine bone mineral density by about 10 to 15 percent, where the bisphosphonates or the anti-resorptive medications are all less than 10 percent. The denosumab is about 5 percent. Um, but in general, the other medications also have a good fracture reduction, not only for the spine, but also for the extremities, so um, wrists, hips, et cetera. Um, but I would say probably the most efficacious for that is zoledronate, denosumab, and Forteo. And uh, um, we usually ask the endocrinologists or the primary care doctors to help manage this um, because there are some nuances in terms of monitoring uh, labs, um, associated with bone health um, if you're on one of these medications. Uh, so if you are on one or considering getting one, either have an endocrinologist manage it or your primary care doctor. Um, 
I wanted to show you a couple of case examples and then we can uh, end up um, um, taking questions from the audience. This is a patient uh, courtesy of someone uh, in my fellowship training who you can see has multiple levels of arthritis in the low back, um, has multiple levels of compression fractures. Her head is off the x-ray panel. Uh, you can see that usually the ear uh, or the head should be over the pelvis. And so this forward leaning um, is, is, like we talked about, quite disabling. Um, like I talked about, we try to do as much stuff non-operatively um, to help with pain management of the low back, but um, in order to help someone stand up straight, um, surgery really is the most efficacious means. We found that non-operative treatment for patients with adult spinal deformity or patients with this sagittal plane deformity, uh, surgical correction um, is cost-effective and uh, provides a improvement in, significant improvements in quality of life. Although, as you'll see, um, it is a major undertaking, and so if you are considering this, it's important to make sure that a, a very skilled surgeon um, is involved, and there's a lot of consideration before you undergo it. So the surgeries that are, that are involved to restore alignment um, really involve uh, giving an internal support to the entire spine, or a large portion of it, in order to help someone stand up straight. And you can see in this picture that the instrumentation extended from the upper part of their, of their chest cavity all the way down to their pelvis. Um, you can see that the head uh, overlies the pelvis, though, and quite an improvement in quality of life. Usually the gains of this are seen um, six weeks, three months afterwards. In several of my patients, I saw a lady two days ago who gave me a hug, and she was only four weeks out after surgery because she had a lot of difficulty standing up right before that. Um, this is a patient I showed earlier with the scoliosis, uh, one of the patients that I operated on about six weeks ago. Um, he has about one or two out of ten back pain, standing upright, happy with his posture also from the side. Um, again, a major undertaking, but um, if done well, can have a, a nice effect. So I went fast, a little faster than I expected, um, but I think we'll have um, a lot of time for questions because I know that this just touched the tip of the iceberg and um, I'm happy to um, answer any questions about what we covered. So the question is, are there any uh, lifetime activities that can help reduce the risk um, of developing osteoporosis? Um, the major activities are weight-bearing activities. So running is good, um, impact activities. So something like swimming, Probably not, it's good for a cardiovascular standpoint, but from a bone standpoint, um, not the best. Um, so it's mainly impact activity. So weightlifting is good. It doesn't have to be significant amount of weights, but something that just provides um, a force to your bones. So the question really gets at prevention of these changes in the spine. Are there any um, postural techniques um, that can prevent development of uh, either osteoporosis or the degenerative disc disease. So a lot of what the physical therapy works on in people who have early stages of arthritis or even late stages of arthritis is really to try to offload the spine. And we just talked about it loading it, but there's this balance. And so we focus on core strengthening, um, extension exercises and strengthening of the paraspinal muscles, so the muscles that allow you to extend your spine. Um, so activities like Pilates are very good for that. And really that allows the, the rest of your body to offload the spine because the muscles are the ones that are uh, taking more of the, the pressure than the spine. But there, there is a balance. Um, you need to have force on the spine in order to have good bone quality, but at the same time, if you um, have poor mechanics, then those forces can be, um, can be abnormal to the spine. Yeah, that's a good question. So the question is um, to clarify what the mechanism of action of the, um, the osteoporosis medications are and how do you determine which ones are the right ones to use. Um, the traditional medications were the bisphosphonates. Those were the original first generation. And a lot of patients have been on those. And I think because of that, there's the longest data to support their efficacy. Because of that, the insurance companies, usually those are the medications that they approve as the first line. 
now that there are the newer medications like Forteo, as well as denosumab, and even other, there's another class of medication that I didn't cover um, that are newer, but the data is starting to come out that they have um, good efficacy as well. Those um, still are usually used as second line, but there are times when we've started to notice, talking with endocrinologists as well as primary care doctors, that the use of those other medications um, is starting to become first line because of their e efficacy. Um, I can't tell you wh what's the best thing for you, but that's, that's a, a good discussion to have with endocrinologists and your primary care doctor. That is correct. Um, so the question is that um, do the bisphosphonates stay in your system long term and do they have other side effects? And the answer is yes, based on the mechanism of action, they block the osteoclasts by embedding in the bone. Um, and there are side effects that are reported. There are atypical fractures of the femurs, subtrochanteric fractures. There's also osteonecrosis of the jaw. Those are the ones that are most publicized. Um, and there are, because of that, there are discussions and recommendations for having holidays, so being off the bisphosphonates for a certain amount of time. Um, and something similar stuff holds true to Forteo and the other medications. You can only be on Forteo for two years total. That's the maximum for your entire life. Yes. So the question is, if you have pain in the leg, can you um, just reliably localize and pinpoint which area of the spine that may be causing that pain? So we can, um, and there are several ways that we do it. One is based on the distribution of the leg pain. We talked about certain nerves having uh, certain distributions of pain. We also correlate those symptoms with what the MRI shows. Now, when there's multiple levels of arthritis and potential areas of compression, we need another test to help with that. And there are two types of tests. One is called a nerve conduction study, which looks at the response of the muscles to the nerve um, um, firing versus the actual, how the signal down the nerve, uh, how the nerve transduces the signal. That's one, the nerve conduction. And the second, the second one is um, to uh, do injections. And those are also, they're diagnostic, but they're also therapeutic. So we have one of our non-operative spine specialists, so a physiatrist, use an x-ray to localize an injection that's a combination of a local anesthetic as well as a uh, steroid. And we put it around the nerve that we think is causing the pain. If you inject that nerve and it takes away that nerve pain, we're pretty confident that that's what's causing the pain. So diagnostically, it tells us that's the area, and therapeutically, it's helpful because it's, it's worked. But if it doesn't help, then it could mean that the, pain, the, the source of the pain is somewhere else. So it, it's a little bit of a, a puzzle, a game to, tr to figure it out, um, and it takes some time and patience, but a lot of times we can localize. And that's really how we determine which levels to do surgery on if there's multiple levels causing a problem. So two-part question. One is um, because calcium and vitamin D are so closely linked to the development of osteoporosis, are there ways in, are there recommendations for calcium and vitamin D? Um, and in people who have difficult time absorbing them, are there any recommendations for increasing that ability? And then two is um, in regards to the discs. Can you prevent them from, once they've started, can you prevent it from um, continuing? The first question, good sources of vitamin D, the, the major thing are you know, yogurts, milks, um, those types of things, even supplementation with, with vitamins. But um, recently I uh, read that the best source of those is natural foods. So the multivitamins, those types of things are not very well absorbed. So, I would stick more with the food categories. In terms of how to improve absorption, that's a little past my expertise. Um, but I'm happy to look into it for you and, and get back to you on that. Uh, in, in addition to the prevention, or in prevention, we talked a little bit about offloading the spine, having good mechanics. That's one aspect to help minimize it. But a good portion of degenerative disc disease is genetic. and. Unfortunately, when that's the case, it's hard, to, it's hard to slow the process, but you can try to optimize your mechanics um, to offload the spine as much as you can. That's about as good as you can do. 
people have started to talk about stem cells and those things, but that's very experimental, um, and there's not enough good data to support it routinely. So the question is um, similar to the regeneration of cartilage for the knee, are there other regenerative techniques for the disc that may be beneficial? And it's a very um, widely debated as well as widely studied field, and there's been a variety of different types of techniques, um, injections of different growth factors, um, as well as different implants, but um, they're not routinely used, and that usually means that they're not efficacious. Um, and they're still experimental. So at this point, um, there is not one, one thing that we have that can regenerate the disc. But if someone figures that out, it's going to be a major, major discovery. But the question is, what, why do people get relief from sitting in a rocking chair? Um, my guess would be that if it is due to stenosis, so closing of the central canal and putting pressure on the nerves in the, in the low back, that by bending forward or having a, a stooped posture, the spinal canal opens up, and so it takes pressure off the nerves. So when you stand up, your spinal canal shrinks, and then when you bend forward, it opens up. And so when you sit in a rocking chair, that may be, that may be the case, or just sitting down. I'm not sure if a rock, it has to be a rocking chair, but just sitting down opens up the canal. So the questions are around the use of Forteo or teriparatide. Um, the mechanism of action is a recombinant parathyroid hormone, um, and that regulates your calcium and vitamin D um, levels and the, the metabolism. The in, it, uh, administration is a daily injection, and so that can be somewhat burdensome. Um, some of the newer medications are every six months, so they're changing um, the different types of medication to make it less burdensome for the patient. And then the reason for two years, um, I, have to, I have to look into that again. Um, I think it has to do with the side effect um, and the effects on the bone, but I don't know, exactly know the reason for that. Yeah, the question is, in someone who is genetically predisposed to developing uh, degenerative disc disease is a uh, active lifestyle better than a sedentary lifestyle. And I think if you're genetically predisposed or not, an active lifestyle is, is, is better. But yes, I do think that an active lifestyle would be more beneficial for a variety of reasons. Th that's a great point. Um, patient, people who are active when they're younger can develop um, these types of deformities. And I'm, I simplified it quite a bit. That the deformity is due to bone quality and also degenerative disc disease, but it's also a combination of muscle strength um, and uh, other um, balance, you know, uh, having a disequilibrium. So there's a lot of factors that go into it. Um, and there are people who are just predisposed to developing develop, uh, de degenerative disc disease as well as osteoporosis. Um, you know, if she has very severe osteoporosis, um, for some, some other reasons that may be contributing to this. But you are correct that an active lifestyle doesn't necessarily prevent it. But I think someone should live an active lifestyle for a variety of other reasons. So the question is, what does it mean to break your back? Um, so there's a lot of words that describe the same thing. So a fracture is the same as a broken bone. So breaking your back means a, a fracture. This can be a compression fracture, which means that only the front part of the vertebral body, the bone, has been fractured, has been collapsed. There, are, that's the most like on the severity. That's the most mild form of a fracture. There's also what's called a burst fracture, which is more of an axial compression, uh, and involves the front part as well as the middle part of the vertebral body. And then the third type of fracture is a, called a chance fracture, which is more of a distraction injury that happens more in high car, high speed motor vehicle accidents. And that's where there's a fracture from the front of the spine all the way to the back. So broken back is an umbrella term for a variety of things. So the question is, over time, will arthritis of the facets, um, as all the cartilage essentially wears away, will it become less symptomatic? 
what does happen in a lot of joints, and commonly in the neck and also in the back, is that with more advanced arthritis, things become ankylosed. So they start to essentially fuse together. So the late state, the, the latest stage of arthritis um, is where the body is trying to stabilize the spine because arthritis becomes immobile or it becomes lax. And that's where the bony overgrowth, the osteophytes I talked about, grow so that it can help stabilize things. And once they form around the entire facet, it can actually prevent motion altogether. And at that point, if that's where the pain is coming from, yes, the pain can go away. Right. <laughs> it's only one joint, though. <laughs> but the same thing happens in your hip, in your knee. Initially, um, it's lax, has a lot of mobility to it. But then at the e end stage of arthritis, where there's very little cartilage and there's a lot of oste osteophytes, you get quite a bit of stiffness. So the question is, how is arthritis, if at all, connected to osteoporosis? So arthritis is a disorder of cartilage and osteoporosis is a disorder of bone. Um, they can be mutually, mutually exclusive, and a lot of times they are in terms of their pathology, but they end up manifesting together because they're a consequence of age. The question is, um, based on a patient experience or patient story of severe osteoporosis, raise the inquiry of other uh, augmentation techniques of bone using cement. So it's not a crazy idea. Um, it's actually a very reasonable idea. And we don't use it as a preventative technique, except for the, actually I can show you here. In this patient, you see these white areas here and in here, that's cement. And we use that to prevent fractures at the top of these constructs uh, because when you go from a transition of stiffness to non-stiff or mobile, there's a lot more pressure on the top vertebra. And in patients who are older, there's a risk of having a fracture at the top. So cement augmentation we do quite commonly now um, in these patients that are having surgery. Cement for, in other scenarios, is used more in the setting of the treatment of a fracture. So say someone has a compression fracture in their back, if after three months of not healing and there's still pain and there's an MRI that de essentially diagnoses that it hasn't healed, then cement, injecting cement to give it stability is indicated. Um, we also use it in the, in the trauma setting. So say someone has a proximal humerus fracture or a shoulder fracture um, or other areas, some people will use cement as an augment, augmentation, but just as a preventative technique, we don't, we don't do it. Yeah, the question is, can other preventative techniques in someone who has very severe osteoporosis to prevent a fracture? The trouble in that scenario is you don't know where it's gonna fracture. And so you can't prophylactically cement everything, yeah. <laughs> But there are, there are children, um, one disorder is called osteogenesis imperfecta. It's a disorder of collagen where there's varying severities, but those children, even just moving them, can have a fracture of their bones. And there are times when there is an indication for prophylactic nailing of femurs and other bones, but in adults, that's not, um, that's not done. The question is in someone who's on a medication such as prednisone that may that is known to cause uh, fragile bones, are there any other preventative techniques to, that you can take to prevent fractures? Not many, other than what we've talked about before, the calcium, vitamin D. Um, but yes, patients who have autoimmune disorders, rheumatoid, or um, other disorders that require being on steroids, those patients are very high risk of fractures, and again, to the uh, woman's point in the back, we don't prophylactically, at least from a surgical standpoint, prevent those. It, it ends up being more reactionary than preventative. So the question is, are there are different beds better for your back? And I don't think there's any studies looking at that. Um, I tell people, let pain be your guide. If there's a certain type of mattress doesn't uh, fit you well or you don't like sleeping on it, then I would adjust, but there's not one in particular that's better for you.
Sure. The question is, why is Pilates good for um, for prevention of some of these spinal diseases? Um, there's no documentation that it's good. It's just along the lines of physical therapy that it's good for core strengthening and helping strengthen your muscles in your in your back, um, just based on the activities that are involved in in it. But I'm not aware of any studies that compare. Pilates to physical therapy, uh, specific other types of physical therapy programs, but it's something that anecdotally s patients seem to um, seem to find has worked. So the question is, uh, yoga's effectiveness for um, prevention of these. I think that it a maintains good uh, muscle control, which is important. Um, it works on flexibility, which also can be good. Um, but again, I would use pain as your guide. If you have back pain or neck pain and those activities are making that worse, then I would be cautious. But nothing that's documented uh, that, uh, that I'm aware of that um, can prevent this process from progressing. The question is what amount of calcium is recommended? Um, and there's a variety of different quantities. Um, I can't say one thing in particular because it, it's going to vary person to person. Um, so I would have to defer to your primary care doctor based on your other uh, medical conditions um, to to ask them about that. So the question is, what um, what are your thoughts about taking uh, collagen uh, supplementation for cartilage and bone health? So a lot of the data and literature supporting um, collagen supplementation is for arthritis of the knees and the hips. Um, in regards to prevention of osteoporosis, uh, I'm not aware of anything that in particular um, advocates for it. And the, in regards to degenerative disc disease, I don't think it is going to stop the process, but I don't think it's going to accelerate it. So it, it's not doing any harm by taking it. There's a lot of mixed results. Um, some people will say it's beneficial, other people think it's more placebo. Um, I think it helps for some, but I'm not sure who it, who it can help. I think it's very... Calcium? No, I think they should, no, it, it can't, I don't think it should supplement calcium. So the question gets at the whole concept of no pain, no gain, and when is it actually, uh, when, when should pain be uh, a signal to stop? Um, Pain that is worrisome is usually pain that is continuous, that's progressive, getting worse, and also occurs at night and keeps you awake. Um, those are the three major red flags that I would, uh, that I prescribe to. Um, if I am understanding the question correctly, is are there resources to assess the comparative effectiveness of non-operative and operative yes. management f for, um, for spinal pain? There are, that's, that's a very difficult question to answer because spinal pain comes from a variety of path sources and it depends on which source it's coming from. So um, there are when we talk about stenosis, um, we know that patients who have surgery for stenosis, at least early on, have better improvement in their quality of life than patients who are treated just with non-surgery. Um, and that benefit is maintained for several years. Um, same thing applies for disc herniations, but this is in patients who have failed non-operative management. So there are some patients who will try non-surgery, but then will cross over and then go, they will end up needing surgery because the the functional limitations associated with the pain are so severe. So there are studies that, are, that do compare it for specific pathologies, yes. And if you want to read about those, uh, it's called the SPORT trials. Um, the question is, if you have a T-score on your DEXA scan that falls in between negative one, negative 1 and negative 2.5, the osteopenia category, um, how often should you have it tested? Um, and the answer to that is, when I think insurance only covers DEXA scans every two years. I think that if you're at a score that is close to being osteoporotic and you are 
at an advanced age, say 70, even 65 years old or above, um, and you're not taking an anti-resorptive medication, that I think it would be beneficial to be tested because if you do fall into the osteoporotic category, um, if it's caught somewhat early, then you can be started on a medication. Whereas if you become very osteoporotic, some people become T scores of negative four, four and a half, getting back into that osteopenia range is gonna be a lot more challenging. So yes, I think you should. Uh, the question is, um, in people who carry bags, will that increase their risk of having a, a, sided, a sidedness to their back problems? Um, I don't think so. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good question. Um, the question is, what do you think are the um, w the risks of having chiropractic therapy in elderly age? So I think chiropractic care helps um, some people. Um, I don't think that it is a risky endeavor when it comes to your low back. When it's done in the neck, uh, I think it has to be done with extreme caution. And the reason I say that is because uh, there are reports of people having strokes um, from or worsening neurologic uh, symptoms or new neurologic symptoms uh, with manipulation of the neck because two of the arteries that supply your brain run within the neck, within the bones of the, of the cervical spine. So when people ask me that in the clinic, I say I think it's okay, I, I'm okay with you doing it in your lumbar spine, but in your neck, um, I think there's a, there's a risk. Any other questions? No, all right, great. Well, thank you for coming.